Hello, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Portland Forum for November 3rd. The ballot issue is 26213, which is the voter in the voter pamphlet is described as Shall Portland protect, restore recreation programs, parks, nature, and water through a five year leaving, levy? My name is Linda Mather and I'm the forum moderator for today. The League is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to making democracy work. We believe that democracy works best when voters are informed about issues and that they are engaged in their communities. We are presenting this forum to give Portland voters the opportunity to learn more about this particular ballot issue. Speaking for the measure is Randy Gregg and speaking against it is Eric Fruits. Because of COVID-19, we cannot hold in-person ballot measure events as we used to. Therefore, the two spokespeople and I are participating from our own locations. We are grateful for support from the Carol and Belma Sailing Foundation, the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund, the Weiss Foundation, the Sarah Fewing Fund, and our Metro Media Partners, Metro East Community Media. As always, there are some time restrictions, and these are the following guidelines that we will uh, follow. There'll be a two minute opening for each gentleman, and then we'll have 90 seconds for each answer as we move forward. And I will continue to alternate through that. And then at the end, there will be a two minute closing. I ask everybody to please adhere to the allotted time limits. And we will start with Mr. Greg going first. So Randy, if you're ready for your opening session, please. You bet. Thank you so much. I'm Randy Gregg. I'm uh, executive director of the Portland Parks Foundation. Um, our park system is the heart and soul of our city. It includes um, over 8,000 acres of natural areas and watersheds and 1.2 million trees. Uh, there's 470 facilities um, across the system. And um, as an example, there's 100, uh, 153 athletic users, leagues and teams who log in 193,000 hours of time in our parks facilities. Each summer, uh, Portland Parks and Recreation puts on free concerts and other cultural events and from jazz concerts at Washington Park to the first Tongan dance festival in the, uh, in the country. And a little known fact is PPR also provides free lunches to kids during the summer. Kids who were enrolled in the free lunch school programs, but during the summer they would go hungry without these programs. Last summer, PPR served 90,000 lunches. This summer, with the help of the federal government, they provided 500,000 uh, lunches. We love our parks and recreation system, and now our parks uh, need our help. We have two big problems. One has been a decade in the making, and one has been wrought by COVID-19. There's a long-term structural deficit in the system due to PPR's uh, over-reliance on fees. 27 cents of every dollar uh, of PPR's budget is, is, um, um, is that 30 seconds? Yeah. yeah okay, thank you. Uh, it comes from fees that are charged uh, for permits in the parks, for fees for swimming lessons and this kind of thing. Long-term costs have exceeded uh, um, um, uh, the revenues, um, and there's a long-term problem there that uh, was unsustainable. We were looking at fixing that, and then COVID hit, and suddenly no fees were being collected and blew a $16 million hole in Parks' budget. Okay, we're going to come back to some more of the funding issues, but before we do that, Eric, would you do your opening, please? Sure, thank you. I'm Eric Fruits. I'm Vice President of Research at Cascade Policy Institute, and I'm opposing Measure 26215. Portland area voters are facing five tax measures on the November ballot. Combined, these amount to more than $7 billion, that's with a B, $7 billion in new taxes. That amounts to more than $4,200 a year in new taxes for the typical Portland household. As families and businesses are struggling through this pandemic and the recession, do we really have $4,200 per family to spare for expensive new projects? And unfortunately, this parks measure is in a large part for expensive new projects. Right now, there's only about a $6 million shortfall in the Portland Parks budget. 
Yet this measure is trying to raise $48 million a year. Where's that money going to go? Bottom line is it could go to pretty much anything the city council wants it to, as long as the word parks is in there. Parks has had a long run problem with funding, but it has nothing to do with accidents or pandemics. It has everything to do with business management. Back when problems started showing up, the city council decided to start hiring more people, expand into more programs, build more parks, plant more trees. When their revenues were flattening out, they decided to go full bore and increase their spending. Now they are in a deeper hole because of that. We cannot let city council mismanage their park system and then ask Portland voters to cover the cost of that mismanagement. It's time for voters to say, stop, turn around, fix your park system, and then maybe come back and ask for money. Okay, thank you. Um, let's, Eric, you're going to do the first question here, and maybe it's a follow-up from what you're saying. What alternate methods of raising the same amount of money exist, and what are the relative options for doing that? Well, the first question is, do we need to raise $48 million a year for Portland Parks? I don't think that case has been made. The other thing, too, is the, the best sign of City Council's priorities is through their budget. And it seems like year after year, the parks budget is always the one that's the last man standing and the one that always ends up with a deficit. If parks really are a priority for Portland City Council, why don't they fund parks first and let other groups and bureau budgets um, try to fight over the table scraps? Do you think that if this measure was to fund streetcar operations that voters would go for it? No. Portland City Council is holding the people of Portland hostage, saying we will close your parks if you don't give us more money. We need to say, we need to call their bluff and say, no, you're not getting that money. Fund the parks out of other bureaus. Okay. Um, Randy, how about other means of funding this? So when the uh, structural deficit appeared last year, um, uh, Nick Fish, Commissioner Nick Fish convened a, a group. Um, I was uh, part of that group, um, as was the former um, Parks Director, Zary Santner. And we looked at a number of funding options. We also looked at the, how the system needed to be funded over the next 15 years. Um, with uh, the, the same historic general fund uh, um, uh, allocation and uh, the fee structures, over 15 years, we would see a general decline in uh, uh, parks facilities, a closure of one in four facilities. And just to maintain those facilities, this is a 100-year-old system, just to maintain those facilities would necessitate a 50% uh, increase over historic funding. And that's basically what this levy um, provides. We looked at several different options, general obligation bonds, a special district, a local option levy, uh, prepared food and beverage taxes, transient lodge, lodging tax, and uh, COVID, of course, took several of those off of the, off the table. And then when the crisis emerged, the $16 million hole in parks budgets this year, we uh, made the decision, the mayor and, and Portland Parks and Recreation made the decision to move forward with this levy. Um, it does not do anything new. It pr simply preserves what we have. Okay, thank you. And since we're talking about the money, uh, Randy, the measure calls for oversight of the spending. Can you add some details about how that would work, what the oversight would, would uh, handle? Yeah. Um, there would be, sorry, I'm having a moment of not finding my notes. Um, okay. There would be, uh, one, an engagement with the community um, to determine what the community's priorities are. And two, there is already existing the Portland Parks Board, uh, the Urban Forestry Commission, and there would be a separate levy oversight committee that would be uh, developed. Uh, and there also would, of course, be the city auditor process. So there would be plenty of oversight over this. Uh, uh, lot, lot, lots of eyes will be watching over this money. And Eric, your um, description of the oversight? Well, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of faith and confidence in oversight. Uh, I think adding just a, yet another oversight committee is not really going to do a whole lot because all of the problems that we have had with Portland Parks, with the, the, the hiring of people 
uh, when there's been a shortfall, expanding parks programs. It's kind of strange that we close parks and then open new ones if we don't have money. The problem is all of those things were subject already to the same sort of oversight that Mr. Craig has talked about, yet we are still in the hole that we are in now. I'm not confident that just having an oversight committee is somehow or another going to magically make the city accountable to voters. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit, a little bit away from the money piece. Under the proposed plan, will residents of North Portland be able to count on Columbia Pool, which has a number of significant deferred maintenance issues being open in 2021, and would it be able to offer its same level of programming? Are there other facilities that might face closures? Eric, you can start us on this one, please. Well, Columbia Pool is, is certainly one issue that, that I'm worried about. There's other places, too, like the Laurelhurst Dance Studio. There's the Selwood Community Center. It seems like the city council has closed down some of the more popular programs uh, for no apparent reason. Uh, yet, at the same time, they open up new parks in, in places out on the outskirts of town. Uh, I think that right now there are no commitments in this measure saying that we will keep Columbia Pool open. There is no commitment in this measure saying we will reopen the Selwood Community Center. And that's one of the big problems you have with this is this is a very open-ended measure that allows city council to pretty much spend the money however they want so long as they use the word parks and whatever they're spending that money on. And Randy? Well, um, Eric, uh, you need to read the actual um, referral language uh, because it actually is spelled out fairly um, in, in great detail uh, in terms of what will be funded. Columbia Pool will be funded. Operations will be uh, funded there. The facility is kind of held together with masking tape and, and, and string, and there's a, a move to make a new um, uh, swimming pool, uh, North Portland swimming pool. And so uh, there will be funding for operations of that and for uh, operations of Columbia Pool. But the actual ballot language articulates all kinds of details, infra uh, infrastructure and, and natural areas, data investment systems, uh, maintenance of parks, facilities, community centers, pools, art and cultural centers, um, uh, Multnomah County, uh, or excuse me, uh, Multnomah Arts Center, Interstate Firehouse Cultural uh, Center. Um, so many community centers will be uh, continue to be uh, open. Um, without the levy, we will see uh, substantially reduced um, uh, operations at our community centers. Uh, we will see maintenance, um, you know, decline even further. Um, but uh, if you read the ballot language carefully, you'll see that there is quite a, uh, quite a bit of detail to it. Well, Randy, let's go a little bit further there. So are there any restrictions on the spending of the funds? Um, by the ballot language, uh, I, I think uh, it's going to be pretty easy to uh, spend $48 million on the things that are articulated in the ballot language. Um, you know, the city has grown 13% in the last 10 years. We've added parks facilities, as Eric uh, details. That comes from a different color of money called uh, uh, SDC, Systems Development Charges, that go to increase capacity of the park system for our growing population, and also to build parks in parts of the city that don't have parks. East Portland has a serious dearth of parks compared to West Portland. So to meet equity goals, we need to build additional parks and to operate them. Um, you know, this levy, will provide operations for those. It will also lower the barrier of entry for um, people who are experiencing financial difficulties. It will make equity the center of, of uh, decision-making in terms of the kinds of, uh, of rec programs that are um, offered uh, instead of being fee-based. And that's an important thing. That's the only different thing that this levy does. It basically preserves the system that we have and it opens it up for more people to take advantage of it, to enjoy the healthful activities that our parks provide. And Eric, uh, your take on the restrictions? Well, I, this is an operating levy, and so there's usually relatively few restrictions. If you look at the ballot title language, it lists so many things that, uh, that they can spend their money on that, again, as I said before, they could pretty much spend their money on anything. Uh, Mr. Gregg had made a great point that our population has grown by 13%. If you look, go back to 2015, if you go from 2015 till today, 
Portland Park's budget, I just looked at the city's budgets today, Portland Park's budget has increased by 71%, and still they have a shortfall. Why they have a shortfall? Because they are spending more money than they're bringing in. One of the problems is, is that they are not charging a sufficient amount, amount for the services and facilities. They give away some of their facilities for free use to other bureaus within the city. They often don't charge for certain groups to use their facilities. I'm not saying that they should turn it into a money-making operation, but you should at least break even on those operations on which you're charging for. The city has decided that they want to serve some sort of social justice mission by giving away or underpricing their facilities. And the downside to that is you run a budget deficit and you have to subsidize it. Now the chickens have come home to roost and the city is saying, oh, gee, we were setting our prices too low. Now we want you, the taxpayers, to fill in the hole. That's unfair. That's not equitable. And we can't afford it right now. Uh, gentlemen, I, and I guess I should tell our audience that uh, we did have questions that we shared with you ahead of time. Uh, so I'm going to throw in one that I'm just going to ask you to explain a little bit more, if you don't mind. And if you do mind, I'll go on to a different question. But could you both, and Eric, I guess you'd go first, explain to us more how user fees work, if in fact I should use that term. Because it seems to me that in any budget, there are some things that we pay for for the community good, and there are other things that we pay for as users. And I'm assuming that um, pretty soon we're going to be talking about tolls on roads. And I come from New Jersey, so I don't understand that conversation. But if, if you could maybe explain a little bit more about the balance of user fees versus the community. And I'm not even sure that's a good way to put it, but if you could help out. Well, I think one part of it, if, if you think about parks operations, you could put them into two categories. Those that are kind of more a, a, of a public good, for example, uh, Forest Park, Laurelhurst Park, walking through the park, um, you know, there, there's no way to really charge someone for walking through the park without, you know, putting up gates and so forth. But there's other things, for example, like uh, using the swimming pool or the tennis courts where you could uh, charge a fee for that use because you are using a resource. Your use of that resource is depriving someone else from using it. And so there, if you use a, a community room in a community center, you should pay for that. And so there are big chunks of what Portland Parks does where they can and they should be charging for usage and they should charge at least a cost that covers the cost of providing that facility. I, again, I'm not saying they need to turn it into a money-making, profit-maximizing organization, but instead they should turn into something where they can at least cover their cost of providing those services. And that's the big problem that Portland Parks has, is that for those things that they can and should be charging for, they either don't or they charge to a low price, which means it ends up being subsidized by taxpayers. And so if I play tennis, it, it's really not, I don't think it's proper that my next door neighbor should pay a higher property tax because I'm using a tennis court. Okay, and Randy, your description here? Well, um, <laughs> the recreation side of, of Portland Parks and Recreation uh, is about uh, uh, almost half funded by fees. Um, currently, um, entry into uh, a membership into a community center actually costs a little more than uh, entry into a 24-hour fit fitness. So there's only so high you can go with fees um, before you're pricing yourself essentially out of the market. Um, so the, the, you know, that, that approach is really not um, um, tenable. What we've seen is um, over the course, well, this year, um, um, this, I mean, excuse me, last year, we kind of rubber meat hit the, hit the ro uh, road on this. And uh, what we saw was a you know, six and a half million dollar shortfall due to this structural deficit. So the really the question is whether or not we want equitable access to these services um, so that uh, folks who are experiencing uh, economic difficulties can still um, take part in them. Do we deny uh, kids swimming lessons because they can't afford it? Do we deny seniors uh, uh, you know, access to water aerobics and, and seeing their friends because they can't afford it? I think that uh, it's, it's, you know, basically this levy will make the system far more equitable. 
And that's an important thing in Portland if we're going to walk our talk about equity to East Portland and equity to BIPOC communities. Okay, can, I, can I quickly respond to that? Because uh, Mr. Greg raises a really good point. He says that it costs more to go to a community center than a 24-hour fitness. Well, if you look around at the facilities at 24-hour fitness, they tend to be cleaner. They tend to have newer equipment, and yet it's still cheaper. That raises a really important question. Why is it so expensive to provide services in Portland parks when private providers seem to be able to provide it at a much lower cost? It's because okay. Portland I think I'm going to have to judge you. spends too much money. Okay. Um, Randy, you have a chance to answer that? Well, it's really a question of what you want your you know, city to provide its citizens. I mean, it's a you know, simple philosophical question. Um, you know, uh, Portland Parks and Recreation does a lot of things. It feeds kids in the parks. It uh, um, provides, uh, you know, summer camps. It provides all kinds of different things that 24-hour fitness doesn't. Um, and those, you know, cannot be based on, on, on a fee-based system. It just simply can't. Uh, especially if we're going to, you know, try to pay uh, our public employees a, a, a reasonable wage and, um, you know, be, offer, you know, living wages to folks. Um, gentlemen, Portland gonna... Parks and Recreation is the largest summer employer of youth in the city. And that's a first rung on the ladder for a lot of people into, the, into being, you know, into future employment. Okay, I think what we're telling our voters here is that this is a complex issue, and part of the complexity is the funding and the ripples from something that you may just think that a park is a bunch of trees, but obviously it's very different, and particularly with the uses here. So um, let us turn now to our um, closing statements, and Randy, you're going to start us off first, if you would. Well, as I said in the opening statement, we have two big problems, a long-term structural deficit and uh, uh, the short-term uh, crisis wrought by COVID. This is a pivotal moment for our park system. Um, if this levy uh, d doesn't pass, we will see it substantially degraded and degraded in a way that is going to be very hard to come back. It's a, it's the type of thing it would take a generation probably to come back in terms of in decreased maintenance for parks facilities in terms of these programs, uh, you know, for kids, um, we're not on a sustainable track without this levy. If we do have this levy, it is not buying anything new. It is simply preserving a system, uh, a park system that we cherish, but we don't always, that we, we often take for granted. And the main thing that it's doing is taking that system, maintaining it better, because if we don't maintain it, it will get even worse. Um, and what we're also doing is making it accessible to more people. Now, yes, it's going to cost the average homeowner $13 uh, per month to, um, uh, to, you know, to fund this. But I think the long-term consequences, uh, you know, we've seen the parks are being, you know, loved to death in the pandemic. Um, the usage is, uh, ha has been incredible, but maintenance can't keep up with this without this levy. Um, we will see, for instance, maintenance will go down. Uh, trash will be emptied once a week at most parks. With the levy, it can be emptied once a day. Bathrooms cleaned once, uh, once a week uh, without the levy. Bathrooms cleaned every day with the levy. And this isn't even getting into the recreation programs uh, because swimming pools, rec centers, and whatnot will be substantially reduced. Many will be closed without the levy. It's as simple as that. It's, it's an arithmetic problem. So we hope you will vote for this levy and preserve our park system and make it accessible to other folks. And thank you. And Eric, your closing statement? All right, thank you. We are in a really unprecedented time with the pandemic, the recession, and it's unprecedented in that we have five tax measures on the ballot that total more than $7 billion. It seems like our local governments are trying to take advantage of us and the pandemic to shake us down and grab as much money as they can from us. This is not the time to be taking $4,200 out of every family's pocket to pay for brand new programs. I'm sorry, it's just not the right time to do it. Come back when prosperity returns and ask for more money. Unfortunately, with Portland Public Parks, we are in a shortfall and a budget hole with Portland Parks because of years, close to a decade 
of mismanagement, of hiring people when they shouldn't have been hired, building new parks when they shouldn't have been built, expanding programs when we couldn't afford to expand them. I can guarantee one thing, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the like button because come back in five years and I guarantee we will be having this discussion again and someone will be saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe we have a structural shortfall now, even with the tax money. Because no matter how much money Portland City Council brings in, Portland City Council can always spend more than they bring in and they will do it again and they will come back to you. You think that this is a five-year temporary tax? No, it will be permanent because I guarantee in five years, they will come back and ask for this levy to be renewed. Ask yourself, have you ever seen a temporary levy in Oregon or Portland that has ever remained temporary? You need to say no. Tell city council to come back when times are better, when they have a better program, and when they can get the management of Portland Parks back in line. Please vote no on 26.213. Thank you. And thank you both gentlemen for your considered responses to this issue. Audience members, please share this forum with your friends and family. We all need to be informed voters. And as you can see, this is a complex issue. It also raises a number of questions about your value system and what you want to fund. So please be as informed as you can. This recording and other information about this and all the other ballot measures are available on vote411.org through election day. Ballots are mailed to all registered voters starting October 14th. As with all Oregon elections, it is mail-in only. Ballots are due by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 3rd. Postmarks do not count, so therefore mail your ballot, no postage required, by Tuesday, October 27th to ensure that it's received. After that, find a drop-off location near you by checking either vote411.org or your voter pamphlet. The League of Women Voters is a nonprofit membership organization. We hope this forum was meaningful to you. We welcome you to join or contribute or learn more about the variety of issues at lwvpdx.org. This is Linda Mather for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter and remember your vote, everybody's vote counts. Thank you.